uh, Drew Anderson hurting. So the initial attempt to send Anderson across the Blue Ridge, operate in the Piedmont, and then go back to join General Lee. This had all resulted because of operations around Frederick, around Petersburg, that Lee begins to realize he needs uh, he needs uh, Anderson back with the Army of Northern Virginia. So this is the area where the clash will take place on the third. Uh, uh, Crook starts off not very good. It starts off like Crook is going to uh, fail his task here, just like the gentleman failed at 2nd uh, Kernstown when we were with him. But Sharon will reinforce him, and uh, they, it ends up in more or less a tactical draw, but that means that early, but, but tactically, strategically, Anderson is going to stay in the valley. Uh, and we're going to find out somewhat longer. You will not leave the valley until the 14th day of September. So, the, and a lot is going to happen in that period between the 14th day, uh, between the third day of, uh, of September and the 14th day of September, because by the 14th day of September, Early has gotten very cocky. In spite, and, uh, and he figures that this Sheridan is an overweighted throw bar. He lacks initiative. Uh, he is uh, uh, rather lethargic. And that's going to result in a decision on to send Anderson back to the valley. Rosemont um, is a property that was, the house was originally built in 1811. It was given to a young couple by her father with the stipulation that he build a house for the daughter. Uh, George Norris was that original owner of the house. Um, he became later the first high sheriff of Berryville, which is our little town right here, county seat of Clark County, Virginia. We are in one of the smallest counties in Virginia. We only have a population of about 15,000 in our county. So the house, as I said, was built in 1811. It was modified many times, as all houses are. Um, the original house then had a big grand portico put on. It had a grand staircase <laughs> modified in the inside. It was owned by a number of different families through the 1800s and owned by one branch of the Harriman family in the early 1900s when a wing was added. That wing had um, an additional eight bedrooms upstairs. And that's now been modified by the current owner as we are open as a bed and breakfast and wedding venue. We now have 11 bedrooms in the main manor, each with a private bath. We have a small honeymoon cottage, which used to be Harry Bird's office. Ooh. And we also have, <laughs> we also have three uh, guest houses on the property that are either four or six bedroom. They were the homes built for the farm managers. The, probably the most, besides the Harrimans, probably the most um, famous um, owner of Rosemont was Harry Bird. Harry Bird Sr. purchased the house in 1929 and moved his family there as he was retiring from Virginia as governor of Virginia. He lived in the house into the mid-1960s when he passed away, and one of his sons continued to live in the house, and one of his other sons took his Senate seat. It stayed in the Bird family until 1997 when it was purchased by an older couple who did a lot of renovations to the property. And it was then sold to the current owner in 2009, modified, added a lot of bathrooms, sprinklers, upgraded sewers, and, and upgraded the carriage house where we do our wedding venues. Um, where we do our wedding receptions and um, opened as a bed and breakfast in September of 2010. We did our first wedding in January of 
2011, and we've done a whole lot of weddings since then. We did 64 weddings last year alone, um, and we have bed and breakfast guests on a regular basis, as well as lots of other um, events. Um, we do honor Harry Bird. The Bird family still lives um, all over the area. Of course, his politics don't really match the politics of the of our day or even of the time right after um, his death when he passed away in the mid-60s. Of course, that's when uh, lots of um, things started changing politically as well as socially in America. So um, he was a man of his generation, and I heard some... some Comments. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was a man of his generation, and we can't go back and change that. But um, we certainly uh, honor his commitment to, to politics. He was visited by many, many presidents when he lived here. His family was visited by Roosevelt, Eisenhower, Kennedy, Nixon, and Johnson, as well as, as you probably know, the two additional presidents men who became presidents who were part of that battle that you're going to be talking about. And I'll let you do that part. All right. Great. <laughs> and Thank you. Thank again, you. welcome to Rosemont. Uh, enjoy your, your walk around the property. And if you're ever back in Virginia, come back and visit us as a guest. Uh, you. Are you acqu also acquainted with the his two brothers, Harry? Oh, yes. His, he had a very Tom, famous brother. You know what Tom was? Tom. Uh, he ran the paper in Winchester. And they still own the paper. The Bird family still and, uh, owns the then, Winchester And then Dick was Richard Evelyn Bird. Yes, and he was the first man to fly over the North Pole and South Pole. He oh, was Admiral yeah, Richard Bird. Richard was Bird. Harry Bird's brother. Okay. And there's another story not many people know about Tom. Mm -hmm. Now, Tom knew in the background that the birds had some people of color in the family tree. And there was a very prominent black man that was a, one of the first members of the board of, uh, of the Federal Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve that had a summer home over near, uh, near uh, uh, where the, uh, 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 where they had the mill. Mm -hmm. the and mill. Tom and this black man, uh, uh, Tom, when he would meet this black man who was very prominent, and Harry was there, he would say, Oh, cuz. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the black man would say, Oh, cuz. And he said, That's his, not unusual. And he said, <laughs> He said, his brother Richard was not happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> had you heard that story? I had not heard that I story, got but there's many, many skeletons and many family closets. We keep hearing about them. In I got it from the individual that uh, uh, was on the board, uh, the board of governors. <laughs> Thank you very much for that, sharing that story. And I'll turn you on back over to your your crew here, who are yep. ready to tell you about all the rest of the battle that took place. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Okay. You take the lead. And as I was saying that, I was trying to find in the binder the map of Berryville so I could say, turn to the page to look at, you know, and uh, we had no map of Berryville uh, in the binder. So it's been ignored. See? <laughs> I proved my point. Um, but even though it's a small battle, relatively speaking, with small <laughs> casualties, it's pretty important, I think, is it sets up the future events for just. Uh, <clears throat> less than two weeks later, you have, of course, um, the Battle of Third Winter. So, so it, it, it sets all that up. It's a meeting engagement. Uh, Anderson, uh, with Kershaw's division, is coming um, out of Winchester on uh, September 3rd, moving east. His plan was to go over the Blue Ridge. Some say to return to Lee, but that actually was not what he was doing. He was leaving the valley, but he was going to stay in the area and operate on the other side of the Blue Ridge Mountains as a way to threaten Sheridan's left flank. Sheridan's moving south, so if you move on the other side of the Blue Ridge, you're going to threaten his left and also his supply lines. So he's, Kershaw's moving this way. He's got about 3,500, 4,000 men along with some artillery. And now Sheridan's army is, uh, during its many maneuverings, is now moving down again south from Harper's Ferry towards Berryville from the north. And these two forces accidentally run into each other. It is a meeting <laughs> engagement. The lead elements of Sheridan's army uh, were the Eighth Corps, 
Um, and as they come down into Berryville itself, they also then begin to deploy troops to the west of Berryville. And just west of here, in the area we just drove, is where the first shots were fired as the two sides made first contact. Leading the Eighth Corps would be, again, Colonel Joseph Thoburn and uh, his division. So here's Thoburn again, once, once again, right in the middle of a battle, fought here in the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, I'm going to backtrack just a little bit, because I, I, I said on my bus I want to read a quote, which is a fairly famous quote, but it has a lot to do not just with setting up the later destruction of the Shenandoah Valley, what's known in history today as the burning, that's the part of the quote that everybody uh, um, uses, but also um, it helps explain again why Sheridan's being cautious. Some people say he's very timid, he's uh, may maybe it's his first command, his independent command, and that's why he's being nervous. A lot of his uh, caution in the early stages of this campaign, August and September, had to do not only with that, him taking full command for the first time in an independent operation, but also he's being told by Grant to be careful. There have been reports uh, that, that Lee was sending reinforcements out into the valley. At one point, uh, uh, Grant told Sheridan, we've had uh, information that two divisions of Confederate infantry have been sent by Lee out to the valley. Well, it was only one division, but Sheridan didn't know that. And we know the numbers today have Sheridan with much larger numbers. But at the time, uh, they weren't so positive of that. And, and this report of, you know, reinforcements from Lee and the Petersburg-Richmond area make it seem like the numbers are, you know, close to even. So Grant's telling. He's telling Sheridan to be careful. And that's another reason why he's being so cautious and, and somewhat timid. Yes. He also sends a, a quote, a spy up here, uh, uh, officers as a staff officer loyal to him to watch Sheridan. Okay. You want to tell that story? No. Well, you go. I, I just wanted to add that. Okay. I'd like to hear more about it. <laughs> so here's a quote. This is the part of the quote that everybody usually normally uses in, in, um, in writings about this campaign. Uh, basically, give the enemy no rest. This is, Grant to, this is Grant to Sheridan. Give the enemy no rest, and if possible, uh, follow the enemy to the Virginia Central Railroad. Follow that far. Do all the damage to the railroads and crops you can. Carry off livestock of all descriptions. The Negroes is to prevent further planting. If the war is to last another year, we want the Shenandoah Valley to remain a barren waste. And that's one of the many orders, or some of the multiple orders that Grant gives Sheridan that sets up the burning. Here's the part of the quote that nobody uses, but it has a lot to do with Grant telling Sheridan uh, to be ready. He's saying, I think it is likely now all the troops will be ordered back from the valley meaning the reinforcements Lee sent out here, well, eventually they're going to get called back to Richmond. So all those troops will be ordered back from the valley, except uh, they believe to be a minimum number to detain you. Watch closely. And if you find this theory correct, push that with all vigor. So basically, uh, Grant's telling Sheridan, uh, be careful now, because we, get, we know that, 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 they're, that Early's been reinforced, but eventually those troops will leave. And when they do, I want you to be ready to go. And I want you to start being more aggressive. So that's what, what, what set, again, sets up his forward movement down to Berryville, which leads to this battle. So now there's a meeting engagement. The first shots are fired around 4, uh, four o'clock in the afternoon. The skirmishers from both sides begin to, to fire here west of Berryville. And then Thoburn brings up his first brigade, uh, uh, three regiments, and begins to deploy them on top of this ridge right out here in front of me. They're looking west. Uh, unfortunately, that ground is privately owned today and unprotected. Um, but in any case... There's some washed out entrenchments up there. And so Thurborn's going to have his men deploy in those entrenchments with the idea of holding on until he can bring up more of his troops. And he begins to deploy some of those on the other side of the Berryville Pike. Business 7, the road we came in on, was the original Berryville Pike where the new high school is today. And the line extends on both sides of the road. And once all the troops from his entire division were in place, he planned to counterattack and move forward. The problem is, for Shaw's men are closer and deploying faster. And they start their attack first. So the uh, action really begins to heat up uh, right out here in front of us. And also, the Confederates on the other side of the road begin to swing around um, Thoburn's right. At the same time, another brigade on Kershaw's division starts to move uh, concealed off to Thoburn's left. This is a brigade of uh, Mississippi soldiers. I want to see if I can find a photograph here of a particular soldier I want to talk about. Just briefly. Oh, this, by the way, is Colonel Joseph Thoburn. If you didn't see him on the wayside earlier, this is the man I mentioned yesterday who's now commanding these troops here, but also the man I mentioned yesterday that had uh, served uh, as a colonel of a division longer than anybody else. The man I'm talking about here leading his Mississippi troops 
uh, trying to get off to Thurber's left to launch an attack from that direction is this man right here. Anybody recognize him? Benjamin Humphreys. Very good. This is uh, Brigadier General Benjamin Humphreys. Receipts box sale. Exactly right. The Mississippians I'm talking about that are going to make this attack against Thoburn's left are Barksdale's old brigade, the one that attacked the Peach Orchard at Gettysburg. And when Barksdale got killed at Gettysburg, it's Humphreys that takes over. So throughout the rest of the war, it's Humphreys' brigade. So these are obviously very good troops we're talking about that are going to make this attack. And so what happens, essentially, I'll, I'll make a short story out of it, before Thoburn can bring all of his men up and start moving forward to make his attack, he's getting attacked instead from really three directions, uh, front, right, and left, uh, all at the same time. And not surprisingly, uh, his line will be crushed and driven back in confusion in this direction. Somebody, we talked about this yesterday when I uh, first mentioned Thober and why he was never promoted. And somebody in the group, I don't know who it was, had a very good point. A lot of the battles he fought in, although through no fault of his own, turned out to be Union defeats. And so you're, it is hard to get promoted from Colonel to Brigadier General when every single battle you fight in Turns out to be a defeat for your army. Defeated armies don't get promotions as quickly as victorious armies do. And, and as you can imagine, Thoburn uh, here was mortified by what happened. His, his troops were simply routing off the battlefield. Let me see if I can find a quote really quickly about that. I know it's in here somewhere. Uh, because uh, he was quite um, embarrassed by this. Because it almost lost them at this engagement. So the enemy moved upon my left flank and from out of the cover of woods and also a cornfield. As the enemy advanced, a battery was opened on our front, and the left of the line at once gave away. Now again, I just want to read another quote too, uh, how about how bitter this fighting was. Again, it's looked at as a mere skirmish in the history books and kind of gets overlooked altogether, but to the men in it, on the front line, this was a hard-fought action. Life and death struggle, right up here in those washed-out entrenchments. Here's a description from one of... Um, Thoburn's uh, soldiers, a West Virginia soldier, Lieutenant Colonel Jacobs uh, Weddles. Uh, he said, um, during this fighting, a great tall Reb, right in front of the attacking line, made a jump at me and sought to reach out and lunge with his bayonet. It was close work, I tell you. He had the longest arms and made the biggest lunge, and he was going for me. The point of his bayonet gave me a prod in the lower part of the breastbone, which drew blood. He was about to step forward to be sure the next time when one of the, our boys near me jumped up Placing his muskets near the fellow's head, blew it near completely off. It was in, as narrow as I wanted it. So this is pretty bitter, very deadly fighting. Um, now his whole line, Thoburn's whole line, gives away. And in his report, uh, he found the, the collapse su uh, surprising, although I think considering how outnumbered it was, it really wasn't surprising. But again, he was mortified, and this is what he wrote. It was with mortification that I report the giving away of my command on the left. I can assure you that the men and officers felt their disgrace and also believed themselves capable of doing better things. But now they're uh, being routed and driven back off the field. And what's going to help save the day is the next division moving up onto the field, the next Union troops from the 8th Corps, and these will be troops commanded by none other than Colonel Rutherford B. Hayes and his brigade. Do you want to add anything to that? And that, um, and uh, they saved the day, and it also has the effect of retaining Kershaw here until the 14th. So you could change all the, all the situation, and by the 14th, year, uh, he's going to start to leave here again. And this time, uh, Grant's going to, uh, Sheridan is going to find out about it, which we'll talk about later. And Grant has just visited him on the 17th at their meeting at their at the Rutherford House in uh, in uh, so, uh, the north of uh, just in the northern fringes of of uh, Charleston, and and Grant has come up here uh, uh, with his plan, uh, as he says, for Sheridan to take the offensive, and Sheridan is already because of uh, his uh, use of uh, of a Quaker later. Rebecca Wright and John Laws, a black man, has found out that Anderson has left. A wall on the eastern side of this property. I went and tried to find it back in 2014 for the 150th anniversary program I did. I don't know if the wall even exists, but essentially what happens is the Confederates are chasing Thoburn back when Hayes forms his men behind this wall and then they pop up close range, open fire, and then Hayes orders a counterattack, leading it himself and it drives the Confederates back across the same grounds where Rosemont 
was and is today. And, and the battle then will end right out here as uh, the Union troops retake these entrenchments. And the fighting lasts till well after dark um, before both sides uh, eventually cease fire. So it was a, almost a draw, essentially. Uh, uh, even though um, Sheridan has most of his army close to the field, only uh, three brigades, essentially, of his uh, Eighth Corps get engaged and fight here. Total casualties, by the way, just quickly. Uh, the Union Army suffers 23 dead, 141 wounded, 19 missing, about 183. The Confederates, about 220 total. Um, some estimates say the total casualties might be as high uh, as 500. Uh, in any case, one of the casualties was Humphreys. Humphreys gets wounded during this battle and never recovers from that wound enough to take command he'll of his be, brigade. He'll be, he'll be crushed on crutches the rest of his life. Right. When he, you know, the uh, radicals take over the Republican, uh, the, uh, uh, the Congress, uh, they have, uh, uh, they've allowed the Southerners more leeway. And Humphreys has been elected governor of Mississippi. When the radicals take over Reconstruction, they, uh, the Mississippians being uh, very fiery, uh, they, they're very unhappy when uh, the uh, Humphreys forces the Union, uh, Recon uh, Union troops were approximately black to carry him out of the state house, carry him out of the governor's mansion to get sympathy. That would be uh, in 67, the radical state of the, the United States Congress. She had undertaken the second deep bottom of Bensi, uh, which started off fairly good on the 16th, and by the 18th, it's turned into a can of worms down to Petersburg. Do you want to speak about this uh, spy, Granhead? Well, they send a Colonel Shipman up here who is off uh, Grant's staff, and he is to uh, keep Grant apprised of what's going on here. So in essence, uh, Grant is uh, using a, uh, uh, one of his staff officers up here who is reporting direct to him what is going on here. Do you think he's doing it because he doesn't trust him, or he's being ordered to do it by the Lincoln administration? Yeah. Which one? He did. Yeah, Lincoln. <laughs> Lincoln is forcing that issue on him. Okay. <laughs> because remember, Lincoln is. Uh, uh, Grant had to talk Lincoln into agreeing <laughs> to Sheridan, and uh, Stanton is very upset still at it that that that, uh, that Lincoln had rolled over for the for the, uh, uh, for the uh, president. And issued for two divisions of infantry to go, but he only lets the one division go. And he this name. But there's another war going on in this battle. Ron Siegel had faced it. David Hunter had experienced it, and Bill Sheridan inherited it. And it's the war between the Confederate regulars, primarily John Mosby, but there were other groups up here. Harry Gilmer, Hans McNichol, uh, McNeil from West Virginia, all of these groups were just tearing at the rear and the flanks of the, of the Federal Army. I'm going to cover some old ground, especially for the people that were in bus one, because I think it's important that you get an understanding of exactly what was going on. Phil Sheridan will get command of the General Valley on August the 5th. He will meet with Grant on August the 6th at uh, Monocacy Junction in Maryland. Grant will tell him, he will give him the same orders basically that he gave to Siegel and to Hunter. Collect your army as quick as possible at Harper's Ferry. Go after the enemy. Do not lose sight of it. The third one is going to set the tone for this battle. Your army is to consume as much provisions, stock, anything you can use from the valley. Live off the land. What you cannot take, destroy. Do not destroy any houses or do any violence to the people, but destroy. And that's what you will eventually see coming in October of 1864 when they start burning in the valley. On August the 9th, 
share the militia orders for his men to prepare, prepare three days rations, and on the 10th, they will start marching south up the valley in pursuit of Early. By the 11th, Sheridan has his headquarters in Winchester and his troops are farther south. Or some of them are actually down around Cedar Creek. On the 12th, he will send an order to uh, Major General Christopher C. Auger, who's in command of the Department of Washington. Now, let me back up just a second. On the 7th of August, the War Department will create a new entity in the United States. It's called the Middle Military Division, and they will conform that by joining three different departments. The Department of Washington, Washington, the Department of West Virginia, and the Department of the Susquehanna. A huge area that Sheridan has control of. The Department of Washington covers from the Rappahannock River north to the Potomac and from the Blue Ridge Mountains to the Potomac. That is where Mosby's operating from. Augur has control of the area where Mosby operates from. Sheridan will tell Augur, send a regiment of cavalry into Loudoun County to get information about the Federal Army, what the Federals are doing, I mean, what the Confederates are doing, and to exterminate, that's a quote, as many of Mosby's gang as they can. You're setting the tone. On the 12th, that's when Grant will notify Sheridan about uh, Kershaw's infantry, Fitz Lee's cavalry, and Cutshaw's battery coming to reinforce early. And that's when he'll tell him, be cautious, act on the defensive. <coughs> Sheridan interprets that as he's going to pull back to a safe position. And on the, 17th, on the 16th of August, he will learn that the lead elements of uh, Richard Anderson's column is very near Front Royal. And he will send Wesley Merritt's 1st Division of Cavalry over to Front Royal, and there will be a fight there on the, on the 16th that will confirm that intelligence that Sheridan had. On the 17th, he will start to pull back to north. Now, I'll skip one thing. In there. Can't do it now. On the 12th, this is the one I was missing. On the 12th of August, Sheridan will realizes his men are consuming their rations. They're about to run out of rations. And he will send a telegram back to uh, Brigadier General Max Weber at Harper's Ferry to send forth a wagon train with rations, provisions, forage, and anything his army's left behind. The train will be five over 500 wagons long and be about five miles long. Now, it's not one wagon right after another. There are gaps in there. And for some odd reason, late on the uh, August the 12th, the cavalry wagons, about 75 wagons, leave well after the rest of the train is left. As the train comes down, it will pull into a pasture over here about a mile from where we're standing, and that's where they'll take the first break. The train will leave uh, Hall Town, which is about five miles this side of Harper's Ferry, and they'll come down uh, the, the Harper's Ferry Winchester Turnpike. About 10 o'clock that night, the first wagons will pull into the meadow, and they'll feed the horses and the mules. They'll water them in the Buck Marsh Creek. They'll eat get supper. They'll check the horses to be sure they got the shoes, the mules to be sure the shoes are tight. If they need shoes, they put them back on. And then when they get through, they pull back on and come into Berryville and continue to Winchester. The cavalry wagons do not arrive until about 4 o'clock in the morning because they're the last set of wagons and they, for some reason, got delayed. They will do the same thing. The other wagons, the last of the other wagons, are pulling out just as the uh, cavalry wagons arrive. They do the same thing, though. They pull in there, they get the food, they feed the horses and mules. On the 12th, John Mosby had picked up, had gathered 300 of his men, and they came through Snickers Gap, and they were here looking for targets. And his scouts would tell him early the next morning, and I can believe what we found. There are about 70 wagons in this pasture right over here. 
Both he will attack and he will rout the escort. Now the escort consists of one brigade of infantry under Major General John Kenley. At the time the wagon train raid attack occurs, Kenley is in Winchester. That's, there are three regiments in this escort. One is the uh, First Maryland Infantry, and the other two regiments are 100 day Ohio men, and their term of service is about to expire. <laughs> Who wants to be the last man in your regiment killed? <laughs> Nobody. And so they very quickly flee, and they turn Mosby's men loose on the wagon. Mosby will send Lee a telegram that day telling them, telling Lee, that he has attacked one of Sheridan's wagon trains. He has captured uh, 200 prisoners, 500 mules, 50 horses, 200 head of cattle, and destroyed a roughly 50 wagons. That night, Sheridan will send Grant a notification telling him about the attack. He says, Mosby attacked our train today and destroyed six wagons. Now, <laughs> wait a minute. Sheridan was not there. His information is secondhand. That's probably the first report he gets. Now, uh, Secretary of War Stanton will call him on the carpet for that, and he will revise his count on the wagons later on, a couple of days later. For some reason, Sheridan's telegram does not reach Grant. Now, that he sent it on the 13th, does not reach Grant for the six, till the 16th. I don't know why, but think about the route that telegram had to go. It goes from Winchester to Harpers Ferry to Washington to uh, Fort Monroe to City Point. Now, most of the time, it's one day. But for some reason, stoppages, interruptions in the line, whatever, it goes, it takes three days for Grant to get the communication. He will fire back to, to uh, Sheridan. All of the all of Mosby's men's families are known. Gather them and keep them in some safe location, some some secure location like Fort McHenry or other prison. Do this for the good behavior of Mosby's men. Now that's a that's a change because now you're taking the war to the family, not the men, not mano a mano, to the family, and that really angered many of the Confederates because they have this whole sense of honor. You don't attack the families. It's only a man a man type thing. He also adds, where any of Mosby's men are captured, hang them without fire. He will tone down his rhetoric in a second teletype, which he will say, gather all the Provision, send the, send the cavalry division in to Loudoun County, gather all the provisions, all the uh, horses, mules, stock that you can arrest, take away off all the Negroes, and also collect all the men that are under 50 years of age that can bear arms. That way you will get most of Mosby's men. Sheridan does not do that. He has more interest in early. This, this war, I'm not going to go into all the minor things that happen. I'm going to just hit the high point. The next thing that will happen is that John Mosby will be wounded on September 14th over in Fairfax County, and it will take him out of the picture for about three and a half, about three, two and a half, three weeks. During that time, Early, uh, Sheridan beats Early at Winchester on September the 19th. Early drops back to Fisher's Hill. Sheridan is pumped up. He believes that he can break Early's Fisher Hill position. And I'm trying not to get too far in front of your presentation, but I think it's important to see what's going on. But he doesn't want to just beat Early. He wants to crush Early. And so what he does is he comes up with one of the original hammer and anvil attacks. He's going to send his cavalry through the Little Ray Valley, let them cross at New Market Gap that we saw yesterday, set up a blocking position on the Valley Turnpike, that's going to be your anvil. And then Sheridan's army is going to come up and hit early, and they're going to catch them between those two forces. 
They want to crush for his army. Everything goes well at Fisher's Hill. It don't go well for the cavalry. Almost as soon as the cavalry gets into the Luray Valley or a Page Valley, they will run into Confederate cavalry on the south side of overall, overall run. Overall run is a very difficult stream. It has steep banks and it's deep. And it empties into the Shenandoah River on the west and, the tank, and it starts in the Blue Ridge Mountains to the east. Very strong position and the Confederates stop the Federal cavalry. Brigadier General Alfred Torbett, who's in command of the cavalry, decides he's going to fall back and he will send the wounded from the fight into wagons ahead of his unit. That's on the 22nd. On the 23rd, on the 20, also on the 22nd, Lieutenant, uh, I'm sorry, Captain uh, Samuel Chapman will bring a detachment of Rangers over into the valley looking for a target. <laughs> they will see these wagons and Chapman will say, that's my target. And he will split his force. He will send one force to attack the front, and he's going to take his men and attack the rear. As he's trying to get his men in a position, he sees two divisions of cavalry coming behind the wagon. This is not the fight I want. And so he tells his men to skedaddle across the Blue Ridge Mountains, back to Fauquier and Loudoun counties, and he goes to warn the other detachment. By the time he gets there, they've already attacked, started the attack, and everybody breaks off and starts running. A couple of instances happen here. There's a Lieutenant Charles McMaster, 2nd United States uh, Cavalry, who sees the Confederates running towards Chester Gap, and he takes a small detachment from his unit to block the road, to stop them. And in the process, he's shot down and killed. There's a Union and Confederate story on this side. The Union soldiers claim, and this is in uh, Wesley Merritt's report, that the Confederates captured McMaster, robbed him, and killed him. The Confederates say that in our frantic desperation to escape, we shot him down and kept right on board because we didn't want to be captured. There's another story that comes out of this that the group that started the attack had ridden up to the wagons and was shooting at the, the defenseless wounded men inside. I have no doubt they were shooting. Did they know there were defenseless wounded men inside? I don't know. I wasn't there. But that's what comes out. Now you got to look at this. The Confederate cavalry, the Federal cavalry, is embarrassed by the defeat at overall one the day before. They're frustrated with all these Confederate attacks. And they want revenge. And they got six prisoners to take it from. I don't think anybody ordered the first man who first ranger who was executed. I think whoever captured him, uh, William Thompson, stood him up against the wall, pulled the trigger, and he did. They did order the next two men, Lucian Love and Davy Jones. They were given to the 5th Michigan Cavalry. Now, I skipped something because I'm drawing blanks up here earlier. When Sheridan, let me just step back just a second. When Sheridan pulls back from Winchester, he, on the night of the 18th, George Custer's brigade, Michigan brigade, is surrounding Fairville, where we are today. That night, a detachment of Rangers will capture one of his outposts. They will kill one man, wound one man, and capture two. The two prisoners will escape as they're going across the Blue Ridge Mountains. When George Custer hears about this, he believes that local citizens were involved in the attack. And he will order Colonel Russell Alger, who, uh, Alger, who was uh, commander of the 5th Michigan, to take a party out and burn the homes of four prominent successions. He will give the order to Captain George Drake, who will take 50 men out to burn the houses. They will not burn one because it has a safeguard from Wesley Merritt, who used it as his headquarters a couple of days before. They will burn two, the Marshall McCormick home and the William Sowers home, and they will go to the Benjamin Morgan home. 
It just so happens that Mosby had sent a detachment of rangers across the Shenandoah River that morning under Captain William Chapman, Sam Chapman's brother. They will ride by the Marshall McCormick home and the family standing outside in the rain with only their clothes on their back crying about their home being burned. The same thing happens at the William Sowers home. This is illegal. This is taking the war to the family. No, this is wrong. And the Rangers are infuriated. They will catch 25 men under Lieutenant James Allen at the Morgan home. Allen will see the Rangers coming and he will try to form his men, but they're outnumbered. Uh, Chapman has about 100 to 125 men. Allen has 25. They break and run. Now, you've all seen how the fields in the valley are crisscrossed with stone fences. They run into those stone fences and the horses won't jump them. So they are wedged one way or the other. And many of them get trapped in fence corners and cut down. When John Mosby reports this incident to Mosby, he said, no quarter was offered and 25 of them were shot to death for their villainy. Now, I'm an accountant, and I'm always fascinated with numbers, especially casualty reports from this time. And so I said, well, let's see how many, how accurate the Grey Ghost was. And I went through the Michigan, 5th Michigan roster, and I can only count for 14 men who were killed August the 19th near Berryville by Garola. I think it was only quite, but he was not there. He's taken secondhand information just like Sheridan did on the wagon train road. But all of this is inciting the federal. And Davy Jones and Lucian Love are given to the 5th Michigan Cavalry to be executed. At very I mean, I'm jumping forward to, these, to, Sam, to Sam Chapman's attack on the 23rd of September. That, and they will, two men from the 5th Michigan will ride out and shoot them down. Henry Rhodes, who had, was not a ranger, but he had dreamed about riding with the rangers, found out they were in the area and going on the raid. He bars a neighbor's horse and his captain. The Federals will drag him through Front Royal along Chestnut Street with his widowed mother begging for his, for his release. They will take him to a field north of town and shoot him. The last two men, William Overby and a guy they, who has only been identified as Carter, I'm not even sure that's right are taken to a hill north of the town and hanged. Now, they're given the option, you can tell us where Mosby's men are, and we'll let you go, or we're going to hang. Both of them refused, and they're hanged. On October the 14th, William Powell, Colonel William Powell, will take his federal <clears throat> brigade into Rappahannock County, which is farther south, and they will, on a raid, and they will capture two Confederates. They will execute Albert Willis for a federal soldier who was found dead lying in the road. When Mosby hears about, and one other thing happens on the 14th, when Mos Mosby and his rangers on the 14th will take a, Mosby will take an attachment of rangers over into West Virginia, and they will derail a train on the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad that has two Union paymasters aboard. The take is about $172,000 or about $2,000 in greenbacks for each of the participants. That had to be another embarrassment for the federal because somebody's not getting paid for a couple of months. <laughs> when On November the 7th, Mosby realized that before, back towards after he get, learns of Willis's death, he realizes he's got to do something. And so what he decides to do is he's going to retaliate and execute seven prisoners. He will send a message, a letter to Robert E. Lee explaining the situation in the valley and telling Lee what has happened and what he plans to do. Lee will endorse that letter with an okay and send it to uh, James Seddon, who is Secretary of War. Seddon will approve the plan. And on November 7th, Mosby will draw, have a lottery for 27 prisoners. Seven of them are to be executed, the rest are not. And a ranger will pass in front of each man and they'll draw a slip of paper. That night, it's a cold, dark, rainy night. And they will take the seven prisoners and right over here, 
where the school is today, that brick building that you can see, they will execute. Now they won't execute all of them. They will hang three. They will shoot two. Both, but neither one of them die. They are both seriously injured. One guy gets shot back here, comes out his left eye, blows out his right eye, and he's far, he's, he only has about 10% vision. The other guy is shot in the shoulder and the elbow, and he goes down, but both of them are smart enough, they play dead. One guy escaped coming over to this location, and, uh, and as uh, the, the seventh guy is about to be executed, he gets his hands untied, shoves the man, the Confederate in front of him down, and runs off into the woods. And he escapes. So only three men escape. Uh, three men are executed. On the 14th, John Mosby will send a letter to Phil Sheridan. He will tell Sheridan, I have executed seven of your men in retaliation for your men murdering seven of mine. Since you have killed my men, over 700 prisoners of war, some of high rank, have passed through my hands and been sent to Richmond. Unless you do something else barbaric, I will follow this course of action. Now, I will not harm your prison, but don't mess me. Sheridan will agree. Most people end the story right there with what happens in the valley with, between Mosby and Sheridan. But there's another aspect of this. On the 28th of November, on the 27th of November, Sheridan will order Wesley Merritt to take his division of cavalry into Loudoun County. They are to burn all mills, all barns, all crops. They are to take all the livestock. If they can't take it, kill it. And they are to desolate Loudoun County. And from noon on uh, November the 28th to noon on December 2nd, they do exactly that. They, this, the boundary of this area is the Manassas Gap Railroad on the south, Bull Run Mountains on the east, Potomac River on the north, the Shenandoah River on the west. I found an account in the New York Times shortly after this said they had burned about 150 barns, 75, uh, 45 mills, they had taken uh, 3,000 hogs, 5,000 sheep, uh, about 1,000 head of cattle, 50 horses. That doesn't surprise me because this, arm, this place had been very heavily hit. But that's the type of war that's coming. Now, let me just explain a couple of things. I think one of the problems is that Sheridan underestimated Mosby when he got here. He tells Olger on the 12th to send a regiment of cavalry into Loudoun County to exterminate Mosby's men. It doesn't work that way. And he, I, that's my opinion. But I think he really comes to understand that Mosby is a bigger threat than he had to first anticipated because of all these things we've talked about. Also, I've often wondered what effect Mosby's calling Sheridan on the carpet for the execution of these soldiers, what, it had, what effect that had on his ego. And I think the burning rate is what affected the... And, in Loudoun County, in the valley, when Sheridan burns, it's called the burning. In Loudoun County, it's called the burning raid. And so, but that's the thing. One of the things, there's, there's a basic tenet of guerrilla warfare. The guerrillas have to have the support of the people or they're not going to survive. The people provide them with shelter, food, intelligence, maybe weapons, <laughs> morale. And if you don't have that, a gorilla is not going to survive, and that's what Sheridan went after in the burning raid. He went after the people. That's probably one of the smartest moves he made because that would force Mosby, that winner, to split his command. All seven companies could not exist in Loudoun County. So he sends four down to the northern neck and keeps three up here. Northern neck had been almost untouched by the war, but they will. You want to add something in? The only thing I've got to add, those woods existed up to about 10 years ago, and the woods disappeared when they built the school. Yes. You could stand there where they deal with, this, with the people in the woods. They had a little trail there, and you could go back there, and 
Uh, what was it, about 10 years ago they removed the woods? Yeah, if it's within the last 10 years. Yeah. It used to always be a good stop. <laughs> Third Battalion uh, for the Harold Howard series. My friend did the uh, roster and I wrote the narrative. We came up with about 1,900 names throughout the time. So I'm not saying he had that any day. Now he, but this is over the 27 months of the of the of the, uh, of the. But probably the most I can find him on any one raid is 300 right here. But you add what Mosby chews one of his men out because there's a uh, one of the people that drew one of the uh, to be executed uh, sees. Uh, one of Mosby's subordinates coming back with a guy he knows is a mason. He gives a mason sign, and they, they another guy, the commander of the group, substitutes another person from him. And Mosby's going to chew him out because he doesn't run a Masonic line. <laughs> <laughs> the incident that, that Ed talked about is when, when uh, Mosby gives the detail to execute the prisoners to uh, Sergeant Edward Thompson. Thompson will stop in, in um, Ashby Gap when he's coming over here and to take a break. And and also his men will go through the houses in Ashby Gap and what they don't have rope, so they're taking the rope off the uh, bed frames. And that's the rope they will use here at, uh, to hang them in. Um, and while they're there, Richard Mountjoy, who is coming back from a raid in the valley, rides up and, and talks to uh, Thompson. There's a lieutenant who has drawn a marked slip by the name of Israel Disaway, and he will see uh, Mountjoy's Masonic pen very publicly displayed, and he will give the Masonic distress call. And uh, Mountjoy talked to him. He'll go to Thompson and said, I want, to, I'm a, I want you to take this prisoner and substitute him for the lieutenant. Thompson said, no, the colonel told me to execute D7. We're not doing it. He said, do it because I'll take the blame for it. And, and Mount, and remember, Thompson's a sergeant. Mount Joy's a captain. So Thompson, they switch. But Thompson ain't very efficient up here at the well, execution. No, no, no. I don't think any of them wanted to do it. I think it just, they just knew that this colonel said do it, and uh, so they carried it out. Uh, later on... Mosby will tell uh, Mountjoy in no uncertain terms, this is not a Masonic Lodge. This is a combat command. You will not substitute any more prisoners. And that's the way the story is. Get it for a couple of days. When he gets it, he will, and, and what uh, when, uh, Hancock has done is he has said, look, we, will, we are willing to offer you the same terms that Grant gave Lee at Appomattox. If you'll surrender. And most people write back, I have I don't know anything about a surrender. I am not going to surrender. But here's what I was willing to do. Let's have a 48-hour truce so that I can send some men to Richmond to trying to figure out what happened. And Hancock will do that. That's on the 15th. He writes that's, the letters exchanged on the 15th, so they got a they got a 48-hour uh, uh, window. So they meet at Berryville here on the 18th and at noon. And most people say, "I need another 48 hours. My men haven't come back from Richmond." And the general in charge will say, "Okay, I'm not authorized, but I got to talk to Hancock." But but right now, until you hear different, we got a true score. So, and they're going to meet back in Berryville again on the 20th. Mosby will learn that Lee has surrendered, and he will inform the Federals when they meet over here on the 20th that he is not going to surrender. He's going to disband his command. And on the 21st, they'll meet at Marshall, Virginia today, Salem at the time, and he will tell his men, the war's over. I am going to go south and try to and join Joe Johnson. If you want to go with me, fine. If you don't, you can go to Winchester and take your parole or whatever you want to do. But I'm heading south. And so most of them, I think it's 300, go to Winchester that day and take their parole. Mosby and about 40 men 
will go south. When they get uh, to uh, Frederick Hall Station, which is about 50 miles west of uh, Richmond on the Virginia Central Railroad, he will learn that Johnston has surrendered, and he will tell his men, take you for all the war folks. And he will go home to Lynchburg, and he will eventually be uh, paroled and pardoned. I have an account of a federal officer who was at one of the meetings that Horace just talked about where Mosby met with the Union officers. And he says that because of the reputation that Mosby had, I expected to see this giant of a man walk in with a fearsome look on his face uh, that would scare anybody. And I was shocked to see this thin, relatively short guy walk in and say, I am Mosby. <laughs> that's, the, that's the impression most people had because of his reputation. He was some gigantic Paul Bunyan type character, and he was about 5'7 and weighed about 125 pounds. And also, I think you'll point out that he and Grant have a very pleasant relationship with Grant. That's and present, that's... in fact, Grant, uh, some, some people try to murder Mosby, and Grant gives him an appointment to consul. Uh, to Hong Kong to get him out of the United States. Uh, in 1868, when Grant runs for president, Mosby will campaign very heavily for Grant. And he and it, the reason he does that is because he believes Grant's got the best plan to bring the country back together. When Grant gets elected, he goes to Mosby, he calls Mo, talks to Mosby, and he says, I want to give you a political appointment. He says, I don't want it. He said, why not? He said, because if I take that political appointment, that's going to look like the reason I was campaigning for you. If I, He said, I was campaigning for you because I believe in what you stand for. And that's the way it should be. And let me point out, John Mosby is probably one of the most honest people you'll ever meet. Uh, in 1872, um, let me, I, I missed a year. That happens in 1872. In 1876, when Rutherford B. Hayes gets elected, as Grant's going out of office, he will go to Hayes. By this time, the South, the people in Northern Virginia in this area hate John Mosby because he is a Democrat who turned Republican. The same thing happens to James Longstreet and he turns Republican. And he so and they and as Ed said, he comes back uh, on the train to Warrington, where he has a law practice. And as he, one night from uh, a case he's working on, and as he gets off the train at the station, somebody takes a shot at him. Uh, but when Grant's going out of office, he will go to Hayes and said, "Would you give John Mosby a political appointment?" And Hayes says, "I will." And he and if Mosby is appointed uh, consul to Hong Kong. And he will be there about five years, and then he'll come back to the United States, and he doesn't have a job. And he can't come back to the South because he, everybody despises him. So he will talk to Grant, and Grant will get him a job with the Southern Pacific R Railroad. And he will be there as an attorney for about 10 years, and then he'll get a job with the Interior Department of the federal government, the government he fought against. And then he will go work for the Treasury Department. <laughs> And in 1910, he is forced to retire, and he will die in 1916. But Grant will say, uh, and as to what Ed was saying, <clears throat> Grant will say in his memoir that probably nobody but John Mosby could have operated an ir irregular band as close to Washington, D.C., 35 miles from where he operated from, as long as he did, except John Mosby. Now, I was thinking about that, that this morning. And I am of the opinion that probably that's something Grant stuck in his memoirs as payback for Mosby. Uh, I mean, it's true, but I think also that, that Grant wanted to make a statement and pay Mosby back a little bit for what he had done. Then, then when Grant, they get to talking, and when Grant becomes general-in-chief, he goes to, uh, during the month of April, he goes a number of times, down to meet with General Meade. And uh, he comes to, uh, I think, Catlett's, Catlett. and Mosby has been there a couple of hours before. If Mosby had been there two hours ahead of time, 
Grant would have not got to, Grant would have been a prisoner and uh, it had a new scenario. Uh, but there's a problem with that story, and, that, and that's a Grant story again. Again, I think he's throwing little tidbits to Mosby for his support in his election. I can't put any of Mosby's Rangers in that area at that time. Now, after Grant's memoirs come out, Mosby will pick up the story and claim that, yes, he was off tracing, chasing other federal cavalry when the train went by and he didn't see it. But I cannot put any Mosby or any of his troops in that particular area at that particular time.